Thank you everyone for joining us today for part two of our series on understanding systemic racism. Today's webinar will focus on systemic racism in the banking, finance, and housing industries. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be available after the program. Also, all participant video and audio have been turned off to allow for a distraction-free program. We have allowed time for Q&A at the end of the program. Please use the question and answer feature found at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit a question to, for our speakers to answer. And now, let me turn it over to today's moderator, ADL Southwest Regional Director, Mark Tobin. Thank you, Margie, and thanks for all your help with uh, today's program and with this series. Uh, this is part two of ADL Southwest series on understanding systemic racism. Uh, in part one, we explored the health uh, system. And in part two, we're going to be talking about uh, the banking and housing industries. And in part three in August, we're gonna be looking at uh, the education industry. Uh, and the focus and the reason that we're doing this is to provide uh, an understanding so that people can um, who want to help change and to provide uh, equitable justice can have an understanding of how systemic uh, racism impacts our society. Uh, I also want to draw attention to a, a couple of, of anniversaries uh, that, that just passed. The first uh, on May 25th was the first anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, this past year, we have seen uh, a momentous effort in order to change how we view uh, the effort to achieve racial equity. And there have been tremendous achievements. There have been some setbacks, uh, but we are continuing this effort. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, today uh, because you are part of this effort in order to achieve the kind of change that we, that we want. Uh, and there's a lot more work to be done uh, it's hard to believe that one year has passed, uh, but we uh, remain steadfast in our work and we will continue uh, our efforts in order to ensure that uh, this past year uh, isn't just a blip, but is the beginning of the end of the kinds of racism that have permeated our country for, for far too long. Uh, also, uh, it is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre. And this is an event which, quite frankly, only really entered uh, the, 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 the knowledge of, of most Americans until recently. And it's not only was the actual event incredibly shocking, but the fact that it's something that we had not been talking about more readily um, that in and of itself is shocking. And President Biden was actually the first person uh, to go to Tulsa to commemorate uh, this horrific event. And also, it's not the only massacre that occurred uh, during this time period. Uh, there is so much more that we need to understand uh, because the kinds of issues which allowed this massacre to occur and not be taught um, we're still dealing with today. Uh, and unfortunately, um, we, uh, we are dealing now with efforts to restrict the teaching of these events, uh, whether they be the, the Tulsa massacre, whether they be systemic racism, uh, whether they be the events which led up to understanding the murder of George Floyd. Uh, whether it's in Texas or other states. Uh, there are efforts to ensure that uh, schools are not allowed to teach uh, this history. And without doing so, we will not be able to move forward uh, in order to create the change that we need. Uh, I just want to say that um, to secure justice and fair treatment for all, which is part of ADL's mission, that we will not be silenced. Uh, we will continue to educate uh, and in support of those who suffer the injustice of systemic racism daily, uh, 
uh, we will work to change our laws, policies, and institutions to free us from our past and create a future that enables all of us to rise, uh, to help me uh, and help us understand how to do that and understand how systemic racism is, uh, has plagued uh, both the housing and banking industry for, for decades. Uh, we are really pleased to have two experts uh, in the field. Um, the first is Luis Guajardo. Uh, Luis has been working as an urban and regional planner in both the public and private sector to create equitable and sustainable communities. He's currently with Rice University's Kinder Institute for Urban Research, where he manages the policy research team, which is committed to bridging the gap between theory and practice. Uh, Luis, welcome. Uh, we're also pleased to have Jonathan Wilson of New Orleans, Louisiana. Jonathan is a vice president for mortgage services of Liberty and Trust Bank Company. Uh, Liberty Bank is the largest black owned bank in the nation. Uh, he's also the immediate past president and chairman of the board of the 100 Black Men of Metro New Orleans, Inc., and serves as an active member in several other community and industry organizations. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I am so happy that you have joined us uh, and I'm thankful that you're here to help us uh, better understand uh, these two industries and, and to provide an understanding of how systemic racism has really uh, permeated uh, the, the, the lives of, of banking and housing, uh, which have caused uh, economic disparities uh, for, for, for decades. Um, Louise, starting starting with you, um, you know, as much as any aspect of our, of our society, the housing industry is fed uh, and prolonged systemic racism. Uh, can you discuss the origins of how racism intentionally and sometimes unintentionally determined where people of color live? Sure, Mark, and hi to everyone out there in, in our uh, viewing the webinar as well. Um, this is a this is an important question for us to start with because I think it's um, it's important that we grapple with history. And a part of the history is it pertains specifically to urban development, which is more where I can kind of speak to, um, has been shaped by, by federal um, housing policies of the early to mid 20th century that have, that have really been uh, transformative. And they, this has affected the way that we live and experience cities today, and not just cities, but it changed, it, it, um, transpires into everyday family life. Um, it goes, you know, much more beyond that. It's this history has been a, a, a massive and costly social engineering effort, as many have called it. Um, that's has worked in in somewhat harmony harmony at all levels of government, not just federal policies, but I think federal has certainly been a, a major impetus behind this in creating what. Um, uh, Mr. Rosent Rosenthin has called a, a caste system around race. Uh, this has had, you know, many serious consequences that go much beyond housing, such as inequities in wealth creation and educational outcomes, uh, public health and life expectancy, the criminal justice system, and policing, as we've been seeing uh, of late as well, um, as we've been seeing more and more. Um, and um, when we talk about the origins of, of racism and, and housing, they're kind of these three big buckets of the 20th, 20th century that I think we need to kind of grapple with and, and talk through. And so the first is kind of this, the, uh, the New Deal era, uh, which is really the era in the 1930s where the government was responding to the Great, the Great Depression of 1929. Um, there was a lot of effort around the federal government to stimulate uh, home construction, to expand economic opportunity on the heels of what was a very unequal decade of the 1920s. Um, you have uh, policies such as the Federal Housing Act of 1934, which really created a lot of, of what we know today and, and, and have shaped um, a couple of things there, which are one mortgage finance, 
and home ownership opportunities for whites. And then also, which really started to, um, as that was created, it also limited lending in black neighborhoods through the process of redlining, which we can talk a little bit more about in a, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the second big era is this kind of post-World War II mid-century where you start to have a return from a lot of our um, uh, a lot of our veterans from uh, from the World War and uh, some social unrest still kind of out there. So that's kind of the second big bucket. And we can talk about that a little bit more in, in, in a few minutes, too. And then we have the civil rights era, which there was a series of um, we're on poverty uh, initiatives and efforts, uh, Federal Housing Act, I'm sorry, the Fair Housing Act, Civil Rights Act, that really started to shape the way the federal government in, in, intervenes and reviews housing policy. So I wanna talk a little bit about all those different eras in, in some more depth, but um, I wanted to kind of lay that out that we have these three major kind of timelines in the 20th century, I think that are, that are important for us to kind of grapple with. Thank you, and and uh, we'll we'll kind of drill down in that. But first, I also I want to bring Jonathan in, mm -hmm. and Jonathan, sort of broadly speaking, how how does the the banking industry, how they as a banking industry, sort of generally played into to to this uh, system of limiting the ability of of blacks and people of color to to rise up economically. Thank you, Mark, for uh, the question. I want to thank you and Margie and Dina for having me along with the ADL. And I want to thank all of the uh, participants who've logged in to hear uh, myself and Louise talk. And, and thank you, Louise, because I look forward to learning uh, from you as well. In order to answer your question, though, Mark, I have to talk a little bit about um, uh, Liberty Bank, uh, because Liberty, I I'm a proud proud to represent Liberty Bank. Uh, Liberty Bank is the largest wholly owned African-American bank in the country by assets. Um, and a little known fact that that's becoming more and more apparent as, uh, as uh, the economy uh, moves forward, uh, black owned banks are, sh are a shrinking part of the financial system. There are only 21 of them in the United States, whereas a decade ago, there were 36. And at its height, there were well over 100 uh, black owned banks. Black owned banks control about 4.8 billion or 5 billion, which is less than 1% of the na nation's banking assets. <clears throat> Founded in 72, our current board chair is also our founding board chair, uh, Dr. Norman Francis. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, one of the longest serving university presidents in the country. He was the longtime president of Xavier University, Louisiana. Our founding CEO is Alden McDonald Jr one of the first African-Americans in banking in Louisiana, and he continues to serve and is one of the longest serving bank presidents today. The reason why I share this is because under the direction and leadership of these gentlemen, a lot of what Luis was talking about um, has been experienced both in a life uh, by both and by, uh, by way of profession uh, in building Liberty Bank. And Liberty Bank having been founded has a, a mission to ensure uh, access to uh, credit uh, for um, all people uh, in the communities that we serve. And I wanna point out that, um, that just in terms of home loans, for example, uh, according to the Humda data that we file, 80% of the uh, loans that we make go to minorities, 80% or more. Or, or going to minorities, as opposed to roughly 7% of new home purchases in the country going to New Orleans on, I mean, going to minorities on average around the country. Sharing, sharing that little bit of statistic, and I'm sure we're gonna get into more details on statistics, uh, I think paints a broader picture of how uh, policy and Luis touched on redlining, which I'm hoping we get to a little later, and how redlining and development of those maps helped uh, uh, exacerbate uh, minority communities through uh, policy and practice that were already being uh, segregated and um, uh, underfunded for uh, development and services. And with whether it be intended or unintended consequences of those policies early on, especially um, uh, in relationship to the acts uh, referred to by Luis, uh, many private lenders, appraisers use those maps that were developed for redlining mm -hmm. to perpetuate racist practices until the subsequent acts were passed in the uh, 60s and the 70s to make more credit available. 
uh, I do hope in our conversation, we can talk about many of the unintended consequences of recent policies and how they are perpetuating the systemic divide that exists in our country. Thank you, excuse me. Um, uh, Luis, I'm, I'm sorry, why don't you go ahead and, um, <coughs> pardon me. Take your, take your time, Mark, take your time. Yeah, no, uh, Luis, so, you know, briefly, even before the years that you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, there was a brief period, obviously, after the Civil War, where, you know, Blacks were awarded property, I believe it was like 40 acres that they were awarded. Um, but then, you know, once, Andrew, you know, Andrew Johnson started to erode, uh, you know, that, and then once Reconstruction ended, and then, you know, the sharecropping, you know, began, uh, and, and then Jim Crow, you know, that was really uh, set in line this system, which, you know, even to this day, uh, creates a, a system which I believe uh, that the, if I'm correct, um, is that black families have about 10% of the wealth per household of white families. And I think that's according to, to Brookings. So, you know, I think it's, it's just important for people to understand that you know, when you, when you talk about systemic racism, it's, it's not something that started 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but it really does go back, you know, all the way back to reconstruction. Sure. And, and so undoing it is, is a challenge, but if, if you really don't understand where it, it emanated from, we're not going to get the, the point of, of, of resolution. And, right. and so, Luis, if you could really help people understand um, these periods that you were talking about, uh, you know, because uh, after you know the sharecropping, and then you talked about um, the period, uh, you know, when the depression, where you know, in order to keep the, our country, quite frankly, from becoming socialist, uh, they created, you know, all these abilities for people to acquire government assistance that, um, which was great, but it, it didn't benefit people of color and particularly black Americans and, and it excluded them. Yeah, it, it set forth two different, two trajectories, right? Um, in this caste system that, that we've um, come to live in and undoing a lot of that has, has been really hard work, but as Jonathan also pointed out, even in trying to remedy some of these um, long standing issues, you run into a, a lot of difficult policy making, and quite frankly, in some cases, even unintended consequences when there are, um, you know, uh, altruistic or benevolent um, you know, actions on behalf, you know, on behalf of the state that's trying to remedy some of these, some, some of these issues. I think, you know, one thing going to your comment, though, you talked about reconstruction, and there's, there's a lot that, you know, even, I will admit, like, I, I don't, you know, I don't fully know the whole history of what we have lived through. And I think we're living in an interesting era where we each have this responsibility to, um, Go back and learn i think a lot of what actually happened um because so much even like the we're hearing a lot about the tulsa massacre of late and um i think i heard about it a few years ago but um you know we have some serious uh deficiencies in our educational system if people who are growing up in this country are not aware of basic facts and things that transpired in, in our nation's history so I want to just address that and say that I think a part of what, and, and maybe even get ahead of a call to action here, is I think some of our responsibility is, as individuals in this collective society is to also go back and learn as much as we can of what happened so we don't, we make sure we don't um, recreate that in, in, in some ways. Um, and then to answer your your question, yes, I think we, we were living in a, you know, prior to the 1930s, you had a lot of inequality, you had, uh, I, most people, though, were, 
were, were not fairly well off. You had the very ultra rich and then the, the majority of Americans, which were working class Americans. And you had the industrial era, which a lot of Americans worked in factories. You had a lot of immigrants coming in from Europe who spoke uh, many different languages and were you had settlement housing, tenement housing that was in the inner city, um, very close to factories. And that was kind of the genesis of, of a lot of our public health issues that we had early in the 20th century. And cities really started to uh, try to work within, um, we're really trying to combat what could be, you know, there could, there was a lot of disease outbreaks and there was attempts to try to mitigate that. and um, zoning emerged and land kind of land use and zoning emerges as a as a tool that cities could use in the early 20th century to um as an as an intervention to mitigate right this this dispute between industrial factories which is where people were working and and were centrally located with the residential areas where you start to have people living and so there's this kind of nuisance situation and the courts start to weigh in the supreme court starts to lay out some very specific guidelines to local governments and how they need to intervene and uh, the u.s department of commerce also creates um, some guidelines around the 1920s about zoning and and how cities can enact their own comprehensive planning and from then on you start to see very early on these technocratic solutions were were starting to get used for um or you started to see a lot of racial embedded kind of these these racial prejudices embedded in that and that's kind of one initial take of of that even before you get into the new deal era reforms you started to see a lot of that getting baked into into our policy making and i think when we talk about systemic racism I, what, what we're really meaning is is you know, systemic racism means a lot of what's embedded in our policies and in our institutions but we have to recognize that our institutions are, are made up or composed of people. And, and people uh, fundamentally have, uh, in some cases, implicit biases, in some cases, very overt biases. And that's what we were living through. We were living through a fraught era and there was a lot of uh, hatred and racism uh, in the air, not just toward black Americans, but also towards uh, immigrant Americans who were coming from Europe and did not speak the language, um, which uh, now as a Hispanic, Latino uh, American in, in the United States is one thing that we're reliving again in, in some cases too. That same kind of nativist, the, those nativist kind of undertones are still there. Uh, and we're re reliving them all over again. And so I think we have to grapple with a lot of that. And so going to your, um, I, I do wanna allow for a pause because I think we can get into uh, those eras that I was mentioning, but even just before we talk about those eras, I think we also have to understand what we don't know about the history of prior to, to the New Deal, uh, what we're learning, what we're uncovering, and also what we can all start to do to, to learn more about that, uh, about where we were and, and how far we've come. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Jonathan, and, 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 and perhaps you can, uh, you know, talk about you know the the um, the issues that uh, you know until the Fair Housing Act in in '68, which were the the there was redlining and blockbusting, contract buying. I think were were three of the the primary techniques that were used, uh, you know, primarily to limit either black property ownership or to take advantage of of blacks economically, uh, the result certainly was to economically depress blacks and to uh, cause them not to have near the same, you know, home ownership of the same amount of wealth. Um, so if, first, if you could just talk about those uh, and, and what they were and explain them a little bit. Oh, sure. Um, and just to, um, uh, uh, I think I think the way Luis phrased his comments were spot on um, in terms of description of the unintended consequences and that uh, as people we bring everything um, everything that we have our our uh, uh, strengths and our flaws to uh, what we try to create and when we talk about uh, when we talk about redlining. Um, 
redlining can some some look at the roots of redlining for the National Housing Act of 1934 and the establishment of the of FHA, the uh, Federal Housing Administration. The implementation of this policy, uh, I believe, really helped uh, 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 bring about the decay and the isolation of minority inner city communities. Uh, because in 1935, as a result of this, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board asked Homeowners Loan Corporation to look at, I think, 240 cities and create a residential security map. Uh, this map was supposed to indicate the level of security or how safe real estate investments were in the uh, surveyed areas uh, on the maps. The newest areas, those that were considered the most desirable areas, areas for lending purposes were outlined in green and known as type A. Um, typically these were uh, uh, affluent suburbs on the outskirts of cities. Type B neighborhoods were outlined in blue and were considered still desirable. Type C uh, was, uh, was labeled declining and outlined in yellow. Those were generally the uh, older areas. And type D neighborhoods were outlined in red and were considered the uh, most risky for investments. These neighborhoods tended to be the neighborhoods where um, African Americans and minorities were moving, uh, were living and occupying uh, those areas. <clears throat> so those maps, although some historians were able to uh, see that the, um, the uh, HOLC didn't necessarily use those maps for preju prejudicial lending purposes, uh, it is generally accepted that uh, many private lenders, uh, appraisers, agencies use those maps to uh, echo uh, racist sentiments and implement uh, racist policies, uh, which ultimately led to the, uh, uh, the decline of property value in those given communities, the uh, unavailability of credit, or if credit was made available, it was very, very expensive. Uh, in comparison to um, to their white counterparts, and uh, some use those maps to keep um, um, keep uh, 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 various races in specific communities. So, uh, so things like uh, ghost listings and a number of other uh, um, um, real estate tactics were used to keep uh, African Americans out of certain neighborhoods and relegated to um, uh, neighborhoods. And so over time, <clears throat> over time, as these practices uh, were identified, um, um, there were policies passed to try to deal with uh, some of these. But in a nod to uh, recognizing um, the uh, Tulsa massacre, Something that uh, that I, I that I thought of sharing just now, based on uh, Luis's comments, is um, the Tulsa massacre actually occurred prior to these laws passing. What many don't know is that the home ownership rate in the Greenwood district of Tulsa was actually higher than in the white district of Tulsa, which perpetuated jealousy and added to the 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 the, the tender that eventually. Uh, caught fire um, during the events of the massacre. And so the, the, the jealousy and baking in the, the class system, to Louise's point, were, were baked into policies because of the, um, the uh, 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 bubbles, and forgive, the, forgive my terminology, but because of the bubbles like the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Rosewood in Florida, and others, and the, uh, the, the wealth that was being created in those neighborhoods through uh, 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 land ownership, home ownership, uh, uh, real estate ownership uh, in those given communities. And uh, and I understand that we're not going to be able to cover the entire history in in this uh, in this short hour. Uh, so, but but just skipping ahead a little bit, Louise. So while the, the 1968 Fair Housing Act did outlaw, you know, redlining and and uh, you know, contract buying and, and some other uh, practices didn't didn't solve the problem. Why was that? 
That's a good question. Uh, I think I lack the, the expertise in the Fair Housing Act to, to tell you all the specifics. What I do know very loosely, uh, what has been studied, is that enforcement um, proved very difficult. And I think when we talk about policymaking, like it's it's really, it's not a science. And I think when, when you make policy at certain levels of government, um, there needs to be very thoughtful thinking of, of how the intergovernmental um, uh, relationship is, right, of that policy, right? So if you're making policy at the federal level, you have to really think through uh, with a lot of forethought on how it's going to work out at the state and local level. And I think the Fair Housing Act was very ambitious in certain ways, but it also didn't provide a lot of the policy tools to local governments to be able to enforce a lot of what was in the Fair Housing Act. And it really left a lot of room for um, kind of, I'd say, subjective interpretation of some of the terminology and also just like really left enforcement up to the same, to many of the same people who may not have been interested in enforcing it, right? Like you're left the the what is it the saying of like you left the the hen with in the with the fox or something like that I'm, i don't know sometimes uh, i may yeah. i miss these, fox, these the fox in the hen house the fox and the hen uh, yeah. i just know it's yeah. a fox in the hen but that you know really it, it kind of felt like that and 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 there was so you had some different responses and different different kind of um enforcement happening across the nation and, and so it didn't prove to be as successful as initially, um, well, maybe uh, can I throw a quick example out there to explain your point. Yeah. So, um, because uh, uh, the Federal Housing Act is this huge, huge act. I'm in no way professing to be uh, a, a, a historical expert on the Federal Housing Act or how it how it has evolved. But as a practitioner in a residential real estate finance, I can I can share examples that will that I think will. Uh, um, uh, further uh, demonstrate uh, Luis's point. So, for example, in um, uh, FHA, uh, uh, Federal Housing Administration, there is a guideline um, that lenders have to follow when issuing uh, mortgage loans insured by the Federal Housing Administration. One of these guidelines is called uh, uh, the anti-flip rule. <clears throat> the anti-flip rule was developed because what, you, what would happen is when FHA would uh, 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 take a property back uh, from foreclosure, you had investors who would purchase these homes at severe discounts and then turn right around and flip them to borrowers. And depending upon the state, uh, some states have rules in place where the borrower can sign away their right to go back to a previous owner for defects in the property that... Um, that were not disclosed before buying. And so I can think of uh, examples that I have seen and examples that uh, colleagues have shared with me who, uh, who were in the uh, uh, residential real estate finance at that point when uh, individuals would, the, 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 the seller of the property would actually be purchasing it from FHA in the morning or purchasing it, purchasing it from HUD in the morning selling it to a seller that afternoon and those sellers would walk in and there would be horrible defects uh, in the properties. So FHA created the uh, anti-flipping rule to help protect buyers. And so essentially, um, and there is more to the anti-flipping rule, but I'm just trying to land the plane uh, to make this point. So essentially, uh, if a home is purchased from HUD, uh, in its first 90 days, it cannot be sold uh, uh, to someone else. Um, but with that, the, the law stops short of uh, making a disclosure requirement on the part of the uh, real estate agent to the buyers. And so what I see is buyers ordering inspections, ordering appraisals, spending money to purchase this home. And then when we receive the title work as the lender, we then see that this was a HUD property that just closed a week ago just closed 30 days ago, and we are informing the buyer that they cannot purchase this property. Uh, and so for properties that are generally HUD repos or uh, previous FHA loans, you're looking at moderate income borrowers uh, between an appraisal fee, inspection fee, all told, they've, they've already uh, uh, paid in terms of expenses, $1,000, $1,200 in fees, 
plus their deposit that can range anywhere between $500 and $2,000. Yes, they'll get their deposit back, but the, the services rendered by the inspectors and by the appraiser, those services were rendered, that money is gone. And the individual uh, is hurt, although they didn't do anything wrong. And so that policy stops short of actually putting the onus of the, of the bad actor uh, 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 where it belonged and the responsibility where it belonged. It still sits with the individual it sought to protect. I just wanted to share that example because you were spot on in what you were saying, Luis, and I thought it would help explain to the audience uh, uh, the, 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 the forward thinking that has to take place when creating these policies. Otherwise, the unintended consequences still exist. And, and by the way, I wasn't really, um, I wasn't really asking about so much uh, either uh, legal thoughts on, on the Fair Housing Act as much as I was kind of wondering really just what's taken place because you know it seems that that you know the people have found whatever you want to call it either loopholes or it's lack of enforcement but the issue the issue persists and in some cases it's it's more subtle or it involves you know other areas and and I know you know Luis I know you you studied this um, and found you know other ways that if uh, minimize people of color's ability to own homes or uh, neighborhoods which have uh, not flourished because of whether it's, you know, environmental forms of racism or uh, issues, you know, post-storm, any all kinds of, of, um, of issues that have come up. And, you know, are there a couple of examples of note that, that you could share with everyone that, that kind of emphasizes uh, those those certain issues. Sure. So I think one uh, one thing we have to recognize is that um, like uh, wealth building and economic mobility are are intergenerational, right? And so um, be, because of these initial, yeah, uh, I, I kind of go back to that history part. But because of what we did a hundred years ago, or close to a hundred years ago, and what happened thereafter, that's really set different trajectories for like you were saying mark the um the the disparities in wealth creation and i and that has that has a compounding effect across uh many many different factors right but also um like you were saying we have you know we have even more recent examples of how we do see uh more subtle forms of Either discrimination or just or or out or just discriminatory outcomes, which is different than than something that is overtly discriminatory, right? I think the Fair Housing Act really did a uh, was was really heralded because it it outlined overt um, racism, which was something that should have been done long before. And as many scholars have written about this too, um, there is a lot of interpretation in the Constitution that overt racism is anti, it's not constitutional, it's, un, it, it's unconstitutional. It just hasn't been interpreted that way by the Supreme Court um, because you also have cultural racism in the court. I mean, there are people in the court and those people also have biases. And so therefore, um, what is constitutional uh, when it comes to black Americans was interpreted very differently than if it were for white Americans, right? So that's kind of one part of this, but getting back to your question, we, we have, I mean, there's a couple of examples that do abound. I think a lot of you are familiar, if you're in the Houston region, you, you are probably familiar with the North Houston Highway Improvement Project or the I-45 project. It's been a very controversial project for a number of reasons. It would expand the highway footprint. It kind of continues this model of expanding roadways and prioritizing cars over people as, as a, as, as one of the argument goes, and it goes against a lot of the science behind what we know that causes traffic congestion. And so it's throwing uh, the, the State Department of Transportation is putting forth a seven to $10 billion project that would expand the I-45 corridor in, in, in Houston. And um, we see um, how this does also affect, uh, it does have a, an impact on housing and an impact on uh, specifically uh, uh, on 
people of lower means and specifically black communities like the third ward and the fifth ward who live right next to the highway. Um, there are there have been studies done on the impacts of this, and we know that there would be over a thousand housing units demolished. Um, of 465 of those would be public housing units, um, just at the interchange of the I-59 of the 59 and the I-45 project. There's about 300 businesses that would be um, also wiped out, and. There's even been some good, some really interesting reviews of this design schematics. And it shows that along certain parts of the corridors where you find the most mitigation efforts done, they were done ex explicitly on, in, around white neighborhoods like the Woodland Heights and Midtown and Downtown, rather than in Independence Heights, Northside and Fifth Ward and Third Ward. Um, some of that uh, has is being worked out and, and TxDOT is trying to address those comments, right? But uh, those that was from the initial wave of, of the schematics and, and has been has been seen. So we know that um, there's there's also a public health concern here with the increasing in cars and traffic that could cause uh, that could have a deleterious effect on the um, air quality in the in the surrounding areas and um, a number of uh, uh, minority schools which are uh, uh, close to the highway would also um, be facing an increase in air toxins and so you, you do have to find ways to uh, mitigate these kinds of impacts but it really does affect where people live and it will affect people's home values and the and the equity that people have created in their homes um, as well, whether uh, if they're especially if they're owners, but if they're renters, they may have disruptions in their in their lives. So, we yes, we do see transportation really affecting um, you know the housing outcomes of folks, and I think that that's something very important to keep in mind. To your question, Mark, we're also there are also um, and and Kinder hasn't quite done. Um, a lot of research on this from, but one topic that we are exploring is looking at what will be the impact of a term that's being called blue lining, and it it has a strong association to redlining. But um, what we mean by blue lining is as as the effects of climate change uh, continue to grow, and we start to revise. The standards of floodplains and and floodways. Uh, what is that going to do to people who specifically black and Hispanics who have bought homes near or in the floodplain or in the floodway? Uh, what is that going to do to the value and the equity that people have built in their homes? And so, how do you assess that? How do you kind of grapple with that? And and there's a there's a lot of unknowns on this topic yet. So I don't I don't have any results to show share with you all. But that is a question that we are trying to learn more about. And I think one that we specifically in the Houston area and in, in, in the Gulf Coast area should be very concerned about, um, especially as we've worked really hard against a lot of these institutional uh, mechanisms to provide home ownership opportunities and and housing for uh, black and Hispanic Americans, but you know we don't want to wipe that out. And so, how do we mitigate against the effects of climate change and changing standards? And so, those are things that I would kind of want to put on people's radars as well. We need to be looking out for the future as much as we we uh, as much as I've been talking about the past. I think we really need to be thinking about these things and and looking toward the future to see how we might address those those future inequities and getting ahead of them. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and Jonathan, from from your perspective, I. I can only assume that that you've had people and who've come to you after not either receiving uh, a loan or not receiving fair rates, perhaps from from other banks. You know, what what have you seen from from your perspective uh, that that still indicate that that uh, that that there's something not right with with the system of banking? You know, um, thank you for the question because it's a good question and. Um, there are a lot of uh, opportunities for improvement. Um, starting with the, uh, the, the the first part of your question, um, um, I've seen examples of um, a screening where uh, customers will uh, come to me and say, oh, well, I ran my scenario last, uh, I passed my last lender and they said that uh, it would be better off if I didn't fill out an application. 
at screening, um, it, it's it's difficult to uh, 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 catch, but it is against the law. Um, and, and I find that unfortunate because it allows for uh, uh, individuals uh, to not uh, uh, achieve opportunities uh, that are made available to them either through um, uh, the market or um, uh, 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 an advantage that's come that that is that is being uh, presented to them through a family member who uh, is trying to uh, sell property or a landlord wanting to uh, sell them uh, the home that they've been renting uh, for for years. Um, I, but a, a one point that is sticking out to me is when we talk about um, Luis's last comment about uh, uh, environmental factors, and particularly uh, uh, flood in, uh, flood insurance. Uh, I'm going to go right to. Um, it's important to note that uh, many uh, many individuals, uh, particularly since we're talking about Harris County and Harris County area, bought homes believing they were not in a flood plain. And so they, they didn't buy homes with flood insurance. And so the premiums for the flood insurance were not calculated uh, uh, in their ratios or a uh, factor into the uh, credit qualifying model that, uh, uh, that was used to approve their loan and ultimately close their loan. And so what I find is that in, in some areas, um, uh, a tr a property's marketability can be affected by uh, the type of insurance that's needed because it can lower or shrink the number of people who can qualify for that home. So as an example, if individuals do not have to pay for flood insurance, uh, they can qualify for a, uh, a home uh, value that's a bit higher than a property that has flood insurance. In addition to that, though, Washington, since really since Hurricane Katrina, has struggled to grapple with flood insurance. And the reason why I mentioned Hurricane Katrina, because Hurricane Katrina, in terms of flood insurance claims, really taxed the system. Because Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita weren't relegated to one municipality or a microcosm of a state. Between Rita and Katrina, you're looking at all of Southern Louisiana, parts of uh, the southernmost, uh, southern easternmost areas of Texas, the Louisiana, uh, the, uh, all of the Louisiana coast, all of the Mississippi coast, all of the Alabama coast, and the panhandle of Florida all being decimated by one storm or two storms at a, in a relatively small period of time. All of these claims, because most of these homeowners had flood insurance, really put a lot of pressure on the system, both uh, 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 homeowners of all types. And so as we talk about premiums in Washington and raising them, what we're also doing is creating a, a larger financial burden for those who are uh, less affluent, uh, who are typically uh, minorities, um, who are usually uh, um, um, primary breadwinners or, or, or providing uh, the stability in their homes, having to pay additional premiums that were not initially factored when they were qualifying for those homes. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, just a few other things because I see time is, uh, is, is ticking away. I mean, when we talk about uh, um, policy uh, inclinations and how it impacts uh, uh, affordability and uh, uh, individuals' ability to participate, I, I think if there's one thing I would like everyone to, to if, if there are a few things I would like everyone to walk away with, it's the following. Most Americans achieve wealth through home ownership. And it is the, it is the, 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 the value uh, of those homes and the equity in those homes uh, through generational uh, acquisition and utilization that assist in building wealth in communities. Because the, the, the wealth gap between um, the uh, uh, Latinx communities in this country, the African-American communities in this country, and the, uh, the white community in this country is staggering absolutely staggering. And so when we look at policies that are supposed to make home ownership more achievable, there are a lot of unintended consequences in those policies. I'll give you an example. Often we'll hear uh, uh, in Washington and in states and municipalities talk about, we have uh, uh, programs to assist with uh, 
with home buying, um, with home buying and uh, down payment assistance programs. Well, give you a few tidbits on those uh, on those programs, so we can really see um, um, if they're having the impact that they are uh, designed to have. Most programs, and I'm speaking generally, I'm not speaking towards uh, any specific programs like TSHAC or a number of other programs that exist in Texas. I'm speaking generally across the United States. Most programs have a uh, AMI requirement of uh, 80% or less. <clears throat> so uh, AMI is area median income. The nation's average income is something like 79,000. I believe Harris County's area median income is roughly 80,000. So if you're looking at 80% of Harris County's AMI, we're looking at in the mid 60s for uh, the area median income for Harris. It's County. about 60 it's about 60,000. About 60,000. Yeah, so you're looking at 50,000 for 80%. Though. Okay. But it assumes a yeah. family of 4 with two working adults. Two working adults family of four, two working adults. That's an assumption that's made, built on years ago that doesn't apply to everyone today. In addition to that, there are a number of other assumptions that are made when looking at the qualifications and calculating those ratios. Um, when, when these metrics were developed, cable wasn't as prevalent as it was, as it is now. Internet wasn't even a forethought, and now it's, it's, it's as much of a requirement in most cases as electricity and water. Uh, cell phones um, in Harris County. I, I, I don't think the uh, uh, public transportation system is as robust as it is in uh, other municipalities. So owning a car, uh, uh, having access to transportation other than public transportation is uh, almost a necessity. Um, so that adds um, uh, financing for a car and or car insurance, all driving what's in that AMI. Uh, or what's calculating the ratios that would ultimately help you fit, which is butting up against that AMI. So the AMI is actually less than I thought. So if we take all of that in conjunction with individuals where, where often we hear people abuse student loans, and that's why the student loan debt is out of control, I, I really see it differently. I see many people using student loans as a means to finance themselves out of poverty. So if we talk about uh, uh, teachers, social workers, if they're attending school and the average cost of school every year, just in tuition, we're not talking about uh, room and board. If they're away, we're not talking about books or supplemental expenses that exist, but let's say tuition on average is 15 to 20,000 a year. In four years, we, we have, um, we have um, depending upon the area, well, at least not now, but depending upon the area, you, you have almost a mortgage in terms of outstanding debt, debt for student loans for careers that are going to pay for a single person $40,000, $45,000, $35,000. Now, if we compound the student loan debt along with uh, all of the other things that we've mentioned, we're really putting pressure on this individual to be able to buy a home. Now, whether they can uh, uh, buy a home or, uh, or rent, it doesn't make a difference because both prices are putting pressure on their budget. Add two other things uh, to the equation. When buying a home, there's going to be closing costs. And so these programs uh, that allow for uh, um, uh, down payment assistance and closing cost assistance, you have to thread the needle for the program uh, in order to qualify for those funds. But most people, based on the ratios and the expenses that I've talked about that have these expenses are going to have difficulty qualifying. The guidelines on student loans, for example, uh, there, there's a program for those that aren't aware. I think it's a very good program for student loans, income-based repayment plan. And so what that plan, what, what that essentially does is looks at your outstanding balance on your student loans, your income, and then it generates a payment based on your income that's supposed to be affordable for you to pay. Well, in residential real estate finance, if that payment isn't enough to pay off the loan over a certain period of time, I have to use either a half a percent calculation or a 1% calculation. So on someone with $100,000 in student loan debt, I'm adding $1,000 to all of their other liabilities, which really makes it difficult for them to qualify. Um, as opposed to, if I come from a family of wealth, and I'm studying to be uh, a physician. And so my, I, 
I don't have a car note. I'm not paying my uh, cell phone bill, my cable bill. I have help from my family. Um, I, um, I'm not paying or taking down student loans for uh, uh, my uh, undergrad or my medical school because I, I, I have wealth. I still qualify for those programs on my uh, $60,000 residency. Right, and, and we even haven't even talked about things like you know, payday loans and um, you know, the impact of, of a lot of other issues and, and, and the other kinds of things that become like pseudo institutions like residential trade associations, which end up creating all sorts of guidelines that they're not governmental, but yet create um, whether unintentional or intentional, uh, so many barriers. To, to home ownerships for, for, for people of color you know, throughout the country. But unfortunately, uh, we may have to revisit that another time and invite y'all back. Um, uh, it has been a truly informative hour. And I hope that, uh, that those who have uh, participated uh, have enjoyed that as well. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to, to all the questions, but I do thank y'all for, for posing them. And I thank y'all for uh, joining us, um, Louise and Jonathan. Thank y'all so much uh, for sharing y'all's uh, Y'all's knowledge, uh, and uh, but but really more than that, uh, for sharing, um, I I really think uh, your your thoughts on on how we can move forward, and and some of the things that uh, that people can can take home uh, and and think about. Uh, you know, the bottom line is that um, this is an area which. Uh, the deep effects have persisted for generations and have been a driving force in the racial wealth gap uh, that persists in the United States today. Um, you know, Brookings has estimated that the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times uh, that of a, of a black family. And uh, the ownership rate of, of a white uh, family is about 71% and uh, black uh, ownership in this country is about uh, 41%. Uh, that was as of about 2017. Um, these are things that need to change um, if we are going to move forward as a society. And uh, talking about it and providing a better understanding um, is certainly a good start. So I thank you all for joining us. I thank you all for listening. Uh, and um, we, will, uh, we will get working. So thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for joining us. This concludes our program for today.